Nehemiah chapter 8. As we studied through the book of Nehemiah, we actually finished it on Wednesday night, all 13 chapters of this marvelous book. But there was something that got stuck in my heart about halfway through. Uh, a hinge point for, I believe, the whole book, but more than, more than the book, a, a hinge point for our lives and for where we are. And as I thought through this, I thought, you know, I'm not ready to leave Nehemiah. Just one more, one more message, one more uh, hour spent together in Nehemiah because there's something here of, I think, incredible significance. We'll begin at the beginning of chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Neo- Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. And then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before the square which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium which they had made for that purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maasiah, and on his right, they were on his right hand. On his left would be Penaiah, Mishael, Melchizedek, Hashum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Verse 5 tells us that Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Yeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Yamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maasiah, Kalita, Azariah, Yotzebad, Hanan, Pelaiah, the Levites, they explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. Verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Father, we pray that you, by your spirit, would translate to give the sense so we would understand the reading this morning. We seek your spirit to bend our ears in explanation That we might, Father, be changed. That we might be altered in our deepest selves, in our spirits, Lord. Changed in our spirits. And, Father, reshaped and formed in our souls. So that even our physical bodies would follow suit in our behavior, our actions, that we would be people of Christ Jesus. Lord, I ask this morning that you would do what none of us can do in and of ourselves. We seek the power of your Spirit to motivate, move, and change us and fashion us after your will. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your reign, Father. And we pray that both will fill our souls today in Jesus' name. Amen. Dismiss the truth and you will miss the joy. Neglect the word of the Lord and you will miss out On the joy of the Lord. For those of you who love the Word of God, who can't get enough of of time in the Word and of what He has to say, I ask you just to bear with me a moment. But I have to speak to something that it never ceases to amaze me when people dismiss the Word of God as either unnecessary or overemphasized or, or too much. Some have even decried the overemphasis of the teaching of the Word of God here at the bridge. Which always surprises me. It it happened again last week. And we're not talking about uh, non-Christian people coming at the church negatively. We're talking about Christian people who say, you know, it's just, I just think you do too much. That's just word, 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 and that's all you get. And there's more to it than that. Hey, I understand there's more to it than Bible study. I get that. And I don't take it personally when someone brings something like this up. But I do have to stop and wonder... Do we focus on the Word of God to the exclusion of everything else at the bridge? I don't recall ever pitting Bible teaching against prayer, or against worship, or against ministry, or against fellowship, saying to you all that Bible teaching outranks them all, Bible teaching is the end all, it is all that we're really about. I don't believe I've ever said that. However, I have to ask this question. 
How does God feel about His Word? It's not how Rick feels as a pastor. I've shared with you before, I've been to many churches, I've served at many churches, and I've done this many different ways. I've been at churches where we didn't even bring Bibles on Sunday morning because we didn't want to offend the newcomer. We didn't want the person who came in and didn't understand the Word of God to feel like they were out of place, so we just wouldn't bring them at all. Well, that wasn't real effective. I've seen it done multiple different ways, but what it comes back to is what does the Lord call us to? What does He want for us as a fellowship? And I begin by asking, how does God feel about His Word? Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Now granted, that was written by the psalmist, but inspired by the Spirit of God. You've magnified your word above all your name. Now some of you, you can look up that verse, and I've been challenged on that verse. Some have said, no, no, that's not what it says. In fact, the New American Standard Bible that you teach out of Pastor Rick says it this way. You have magnified your word according to all your name. Either way, he's magnified his word. Whether you want to take it as above his name, as of even greater importance than his name, or if you want to take it as alongside or according to his name, God has magnified his word. God has said, I want you to be people of my word. He bases everything on His Word. When God says, I'm going to do it because I'm keeping to my Word, (laughs) we know He's going to do it. God magnifies His Word. Who here, if handed a prescription for perfect health and disease-free living, wouldn't follow it to a T? If a world-renowned doctor were to hand you a prescription and say, follow this, and you will be healthy, I think most of us would at least give it a shot. Who of you married couples, if handed a book of proven marital skills, wouldn't open it and finding it to be true, wear the pages thin? And yet the word is better still. Who among us, when receiving a letter from the love of our life, wouldn't pour over it again and again and again? And yet the word of God is greater still. Hebrews 4.12 tells us the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. Who is able to, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Isaiah 55 verse 10, very appropriate this morning, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it there is something different about this word different than any other book ever written we've got to recognize when you're opening the Bible and you're studying the word and you're meditating on it you're not just studying a book There are plenty of books we can study. This is not one of them. This is far beyond any book. It's living and active. It is unlike any other book ever penned by the hand of man. Because it's not penned by the hand of man. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And not only is the Word itself living and active, but God pours out His Spirit as we're in the Word to understand even more than we could possibly understand on on our own. It's a marvelous, marvelous thing we have in our hands. And, and, to, and, and to cut it down, it makes no sense to me. Besides the fact that, as I've, I've talked to many times, you know, on, on an average week, on an average basis, we're, as a fellowship, we're in the Word together maybe, maybe two hours. Out of how many hours in a week? 168, I think it is. Two. I don't think that's too much. And so we're going to continue in the Word, but but there's more to it, gang. And and I want to think through this tonight. There are things that we would miss, we would not understand, if we didn't take time to be in the Word as we do. I, I can't even tell you how much I have come to understand about the Lord and how much it has completely altered my life in the last six years alone of just going through His Word. Things I never knew before. Things I had never seen. Paul says in Romans 15, 4, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. 
If this is the case, and you know I believe it is, why does Bible teaching, Bible study, Bible reading come under fire, even from believers? Why, if we truly believe in the value of it, do we avoid it from time to time? And I think there may be at least one clue in the text before us this morning. One clue as to why sometimes Bible study or opening the Bible at all is something we don't do. We just finished again the book of Nehemiah. Next week we turn to Esther. Or the week after. We'll get to Esther soon. (laughs) But I'm not ready, as I said, to leave Nehemiah yet. There's one more thing, something powerful. We, We briefly considered this on a Wednesday night a few weeks back. But it's something I think the Lord wants every one of us to see and to understand. In Nehemiah chapter 8, it begins with that great Bible study, that Bible conference, if you will, at the water gate in Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Now, it's important to note that. It's the first day of the seventh month. That's the Jewish civil new year. That's the month of Tishri. Okay, that's right around the time frame that we're in. We're actually a little bit past it now, but September, October time frame is the seventh month. So it's the first day in the fall of the seventh month for the Jewish people. And they come together on that time. And and you've heard the name before. They're, They're there for a reason. On the first of the seventh month, there's a celebration that takes place in Israel. Perhaps you've heard the name. It's called Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets. So they gather for the Feast of Trumpets. They're there on that day. It's a celebratory day. It's a day of great joy in Israel. Still is to this day. A day of excitement and enthusiasm and worship. And the people gather together. And it tells us in verse 6 that Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen! Amen! While lifting up their hands. And then they bowed low and worshipped the, worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Saying, Amen! Amen. That's how I felt this morning during worship. Amen. I mean, doesn't it just feel good to worship the Lord? Don't you just love to do it? I mean, one of the great things about worshiping God is it takes all the attention off of us and our problems. Puts all the attention on the Lord, the great God, who is able to conquer everything, to handle any problems. We get reminded of that, and we find ourselves settling into this I don't know about you, but for me, this place of joy with the amens. But after the amens, the teaching gets underway. And we see down in verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense. So they understood the reading. The word translating there is explaining. They just, they opened the word, they read a passage, and then they explained what it meant. Probably very much like our Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights. Went a few verses. Now let me give some insight to this. And they would talk about it. And then they'd read a few more verses on down. Literally, that word translating to give the sense, that phrase, is teaching distinctly for understanding. If you were to look at it in the Hebrew, teaching distinctly for understanding. To make the simple, straightforward truth of Scripture simple and straightforward. Not to gum it up with all kinds of things, but let's just make it distinct. What is it about Scripture that is distinctive? And how does it bring us understanding? Sociologists tell us that we live in a postmodern age. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, the postmodern era. Others believe we're in the post Christian era, and I think you can make a case for that. But what postmodern truly means, and postmodernism in sociological circles, is simply this relativity. There are no absolutes in the postmodern age. It's all relative. It's all what you want and what I want. And if they collide, well, we'll just be okay with that. You just go your way and I'll go my way. Postmodernism. It's a mentality that not only has permeated culture, but it has infected the church and church fellowships and Christian organizations who now ask questions like, do we really have to take the virgin birth of Jesus Christ literally? Can we be sure the teachings of Jesus are actually all from Him? In fact, might we not just learn as much from some of the extra-biblical writings like, oh, I don't know, the Gospel of Thomas or the Shepherd of Hermas or one of these other devotional writings that, were, that are ancient as well? Some will ask, why waste our time with the walls of Nehemiah or the Jewish people or Israel at all? Why tromp through the Old Testament? I mean, unless you want to use it as a parable for some kind of life skill postmodernism paint word pictures draw pop up sermons 
Easy listening. My friends, what the church needs today, and I absolutely believe this, is more simple, straightforward, distinctive Bible teaching. The Word of God taught distinctly for understanding. This is where churches and church fellowships have veered off. This is why the church is not having the impact in the world that it could have. Because we've gotten away from the absolutes. Because we don't really even know what's in the Word. Because everything is undermined whichever way you turn, even in Christian circles. But when the Word is brought forward in such a distinctive, straightforward way, there is unmistakable impact, as we see in our story this morning, verse 9. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. This really had impact. They, they, they began, I mean, I'm sure it started somewhere in the back with a snivel. And then someone else began to cry a little more openly. And this caught on. Until everybody is weeping before the Lord. And, and the priest is going, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. This, this is a day of celebration. Feast of trumpets. Da-da-da. Why are you weeping? How did they go from the spiritual heights of amen and amen to the depressive depths of oh man <laughs> so quickly? A couple of things to note, just a couple this morning. First one is the Bible can bum you out. Honestly, the Word of God, the Bible, can bum you out. No other book deals so specifically, so directly with sin in our world. And many times we just don't want to hear it. I don't want to be reminded of that ugliness. It bums me out to think of it. J. Vernon McGee quotes Mark Twain as saying, It's not what I don't understand in the Bible that bothers me. It's what I do understand. What a true statement. Numbers 32.23 says, Be sure, your sin will find you out. Ezekiel 18.4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. It's a little bumming, you know? Is bumming a word? I don't know, but it is now. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul writes, If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Okay, let me say something real quickly here about this. In the church today, we've gotten some new terminology. And it should bother us. People who do not have faith in Christ are not just unchurched. When you call someone unchurched, all that sounds like is they're not in the club, that particular club. Hey, they're not unchurched. They are lost. Period. Oh, don't say lost, Rick. You're going to offend someone who's not a Christian. If we are not in Jesus Christ, we are lost. As simple as that. If we as believers in Jesus don't see all people as they are, why should we care about seeing people saved? If they're just unchurched, well, they're just not my particular brand of postmodern living. Leave them be. Let them live however they want. But if they're lost, well, doesn't that change the way we look? If my closest friend is lost, don't I want to see him found? If a brother or sister or mother or father are lost, doesn't that do something to my heart that says, man, I don't want them to be lost? That's offensive. Hey, I'm just getting started. Romans 3, verse 10, as it is written, Paul says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Well, who wants to hear that? And the Bible can bum you out. And so we have the higher critics trying to put down Scripture. We have the postmodernists trying to undermine it and turn it into a loose conversation rather than truth. We have people who just don't want to hear it. 
truth is, gang, the more I read the Word of God personally, the more aware I am of how far short of the mark I fall. The more time I have spent in the Word, the more desperately aware I am of my need for God's grace. I sense my need for His grace more now than ever before in my life. I've been a Christian a long time. I've been going to church since I was born. But I'll tell you what, I am more aware of how lost I would be without Jesus now than 20 years ago. Those of you who are younger, let me explain something to you. The longer you walk in the Lord, the more thankful you are for your salvation because you begin to see how much you have been saved from. I didn't know that 20 years ago. In fact, 20 years ago, I would have said, in 20 years, I'm going to be one righteous dude. I'm going to be so together, and I'm going to feel good about it. And these days, hey, I feel good about one thing, His grace, not my togetherness. And that's why the people are weeping. The Bible is read. It's not that they were bored. I wish you would just stop teasing so we could go to lunch today. (laughs) They are weeping because they're hearing the word and they're saying, we're not even close. We're not even there. And, and, and I shared this before, as they're going through reading Torah, the Word, they're seeing the grace of God, His loving kindness, His constant forgiveness. They're saying, we don't deserve this. We don't deserve to be back here at the Watergate in front of the temple there, worshiping and celebrating the Feast of Trumpets. What we deserve is to be back in Babylon, in captivity. That's what we deserve. And the weeping comes. Let me be clear. If you, if I were the only person on earth, we would still find a way to sin. Don't need others to do it. That's something we do very well all by ourselves. And until we really begin to understand the depth of God's grace, that can be unnerving. Ezra and the priests were explaining to give the sense so that they would understand the reading. And as they understood the reading, they began to weep. You see the impact just in this one example that just opening the word can have on people. God says, my word doesn't come back to me empty. It will convict But note this, and I love this about the passage. Ezra the helper and Nehemiah the comforter. Remember, that's what their names mean. And so both these two men give us interesting angles, pictures of the Holy Spirit, if we will look for this. And we have over the last couple of of books as we've studied. But the helper, the comforter, both types of the Holy Spirit, Ezra and Nehemiah, call out in unison, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. This is a day of holy celebration. It is not time to weep. I understand why you're weeping, but this is not time to weep. Don't sit there in your sin. Recognize your salvation. This is a day of joy. Bumming them out was not the purpose of opening the Word. Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, celebration time. I remember, Rush, you recall, this revival night in the Philippines. <laughs> and we had spent the week and been going through uh, teaching and, and having time with, with a group of, of pastors and others in, in the Philippines there with uh, Harvin and Laurel and, and Cleophase Church, Living Way Fellowship in Cebu. And on the night that I was giving the teaching, and, and it was called Revival Night, so everybody was come expecting a revival, which I love. You know, talk about just, yeah, God's going to do a revival tonight, so that's what we're showing up for. Well, I started teaching out of Revelation. And I thought, you know, there have been a lot of crying through the week, and there have been a lot of people upset and and trying to come back to to a a right relationship with God. And so I thought, I'm going to talk about our great joy. I'm going to talk about the rapture. I'm going to, boy, this is going to be exciting. And I start teaching and sharing about our great hope, about the rapture of the church and Jesus coming for us. And and all of a sudden, as as I'm teaching, I begin to notice some whimpering going on. Okay, well, let be a little more positive, Rick, a little more of the excitement. And then weeping, which ultimately led to convulsive sobs. And all the people down in the front on their faces, and it wasn't the great preaching because it it had been happening every night. And here they are, they're they're weeping and sobbing, and and all I I didn't know what to do. Like, this is not what we do at the bridge. I don't remember the last time. Everybody came down and began weeping. And so I called Russ over and some of the other guys, and, and we start praying for people. And all I could think as I'm going through my head is I want to say the trumpet sound is good news. This is not a time to weep. This is a time of joy. This is a time of hopefulness. What Paul said, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, the trumpet of God. 
And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We will always be with the Lord. And then Paul says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. And that's what's happening right here in our, in our teaching, in the story. Ezra and Nehemiah are saying, hang on, guys. Don't mourn. Don't weep. This is celebration time. It's a holy day. Listen, if the Bible bums you out, you have not read far enough. If the Bible bums you out, you haven't gotten to Rosh Hashanah. You haven't gotten to the Day of Trumpets. Because when you get there and you recognize what the whole plan is and what God is calling us and drawing us to, well, the Bible doesn't just bum you out. Number two, the Word brings good news. The Word brings good news. Nehemiah Nehemiah takes the podium. He proclaims something that is great to hear, especially just four days out from Thanksgiving. Watch this. Verse 10. He said to them, go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. God is pro-celebration. The first miracle of Jesus was what? Water to wine. Why? So the party could continue. So the celebration wouldn't be marred by running out of wine at a critical time. God is the one. Who gave you and me the capacity for joy. God is the one who created laughter and happiness. We need to remember that. He is the bringer of joy. He's the one who brought all that to us. Now, did you catch how they were to celebrate? Three ways. Number one, eat of the fat. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Eat of the fat. I'm the one on Thanksgiving Day who, before the turkey's even done, I love to take, you know, Cheryl would say, just take the skin off. Get rid of the skin. It's so bad for you. I'm the one. I love the skin. The crunchy, yummy, good stuff. Usually, usually the fat portions in Israel's worship and in their offerings, usually the fat portions were to be burned on the altar to the Lord. And the lean portions were then given to the priests and the people to eat, which was God's way of... He understood cholesterol long before we did. So it was God's way, truly, of protecting his people. I I want you to eat of the meat, but I'm going to give you the lean. I will take the fat in the offering, and that way, not only are you worshiping, but you're healthy. But in this case, Nehemiah says, gang, party on. Eat of the fat, the dark meat, the drizzly, greasy, sweet, crunchy turkey skin. This is what I want for you today. Because today is party time. I know it will eventually kill you. But man, today, (laughs) today, celebrate. Celebrate. Eat of the fat, drink of the sweet. And they're talking about wine. Do you know that wine is a biblical picture of celebration? Now, I know in our teetotaling and, and, and fearful America, we, our puritanical background, we, have, we look at alcohol a different way. And we should. And we should. But there are times where the Word says, drink of the sweet. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6 tells us, The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, that's the fat, eating the fat, drinking the wine, refined and aged wine. Wine is that symbol in Scripture of celebration. But what else is wine the symbol of in Scripture? Blood. Blood. The blood of Christ. What's absolutely amazing to me is the way God, the way Jesus connected the sorrow of the blood with the celebration of wine. And he did it at the Last Supper. And you know what he said? Matthew twenty six twenty eight. When he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for forgiveness of sin. Now, if he had stopped right there, it would have been, Whoa, the blood. Yes, serious. Very serious. But he said, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In other words, I'm going to drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. There is a day coming where when I hand out the wine, it's not going to be a picture of the blood that I am about to pour out in this tragic day. There's a day coming when we're going to toast in the new kingdom. A day of joy, a day of celebration, a day of grand party. Think about it. It was his own red blood that paid for the celebration that is coming in the kingdom. 
Eat of the fat. Drink of the sweet. And number three, send portions to him who has nothing prepared. Send portions to him who has nothing prepared. Part of the celebration was bearing the celebration to others who didn't have any. It was bringing the good news of their joy and spreading it out, giving it to someone who didn't have it. Share what you've got with those who have not. Take what you have and make sure that there's no one who's left out. Are we sharing the joy of the Lord here at the bridge? Are we really about that? I put it to you, dear fellowship, are we welcoming? Are we engaging? Are we looking out for anyone who comes through the door? Now, ironically, it depends on who you ask. I sent out the email this week. Many of you got it. If you didn't, make sure you get your name on the uh, email list back there so you can get those if you want them. But in the email, I talked about the fact that it, that it was brought up that there have been some who said that, you know, I just don't feel like the bridge is a very welcoming church. And it, it kind of shocked me. Because just between you and me, I, I've never been more welcome in a church. Yeah, well, you're the pastor, Rick. Okay, all right. <laughs> But I sent out that email, and, and the idea was not to rebuke anyone, but just to say, hey, gang, let's not forget why we're here. And let's not forget when the door opens that if someone walks in and you don't personally know who they are, it doesn't matter if they've been at the bridge for five years or not. If you don't know them, it's your business to know them. It is our business to know each other, and it's our business to welcome each other. And I wanted to send out that encouragement. Well, but what's funny is I started getting emails back. And I got more emails back saying, wow, I, this is the most welcoming place I've ever been. Far more emails like that than I got of people. I got one or two saying, yeah, I had a little trouble when I first got here, but you know what? I think it's just all our responsibility. Here's the deal, gang. There are those who have said they've never been in a more welcoming place, and there are others who say, I I have a hard time fitting in. I felt conspicuously unnoticed. Is it possible that both are true? Yeah. Welcome to church life. It is possible that you might feel unwelcome in this place, sitting right next to the most excited person in the world who feels more welcome than they've ever been anywhere. Because we all bring our perceptions to the table. We all bring where we've come from. We all bring what we're looking for when we come in here. And all that simply to say, gang, we still have a responsibility to be a church who is sending our portions to him who has nothing prepared. Not just eating the fat and drinking the sweet. Oh, we are to celebrate. But we are also to be those who send our portions to those who don't have any. In other words, we have our eyes wide open on the lookout, not just to the door on Sundays or Wednesdays, but in our lives. We are looking for someone who doesn't have what we have. And we are sending the portions to him who has nothing prepared. Even more important then the experience of welcome for someone who comes walking in the door is this question. Are we sending portions to those who are lost? I encourage you, if you weren't here Wednesday night, to go back and listen just to the last ten minutes of what we talked about. Because what it came down to, gang, is we, we talked about how if we all truly believed in the call to share Jesus with people in our world, this church would double inside of a week. Well, that's a little ridiculous, Rick. Really? First day of the church on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 came to faith in the Lord. Well, yeah, but that was because the Holy Spirit showed up. When He's not here, we don't have the Spirit of God empowering us to that kind of witnessing. Dang, we are called to send portions of what we have to those who have not, which is those who are lost. Those who are without Christ. Those who would go to hell today if Jesus came back. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do? I invite you, by the way, to commit both of these to prayer. As I did in the email, please be praying. that Lord, make us a more welcoming congregation, even than we are. I mean, if someone finds this place wonderfully welcoming, may they find it absolutely off the charts welcoming. And if someone doesn't feel welcome, may we target that one person. May we have eyes that we recognize. Here's a person hurting. Here's a person in need. Here's someone who I can touch. And Lord, don't call me to sit there and tell others to go. Call me to be the one who's welcoming. Call me to be the one who's bringing truth to the lost. Would you pray about that? Can we just for a moment, let's stop and pray about both of those before we continue.
Lord, I pray that this barn will be as welcoming for anyone who comes in as it is for me, as it is for so many. That this sense of family and home and the presence of your spirit would not be missed by anybody who comes in this place. Make us a more welcoming people, Father. And Lord, open our eyes to those who are lost. Not in judgment, Father, but in hope and in a desire to bring our joy to them, to where they are, Father. Only you can accomplish this, only the power of your Holy Spirit. So we ask your Spirit to be more full in us. Clear out more of us. Make more space for yourself, Father. That we might truly be about the business of the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue on. Verse 10, and and this is really what I wanted you to see. This is the one verse that stuck in my heart through this whole time. Here it is. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can make a case it's one of the most, well, it's certainly one of the most, possibly the most powerful verse in Scripture. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Number three, final one, the Lord bears the joy. Gang, we need to understand something. We don't generate the joy before the Lord. We don't bring our joy to the Lord. We don't gain strength in in some outrageous momentary religious fervor and say, Oh, hey, we're joyful. It's the joy of the Lord. We're going to give the joy to the Lord. No, it's His joy. Recognize that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Not joy in the Lord, although that is wonderful. Not joy from us to the Lord. It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. It's His joy that brings strength to us. His joy. Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. That means, and this is wonderful, I can be bummed out. But the joy of of the Lord is my strength. I can be weary and tired. The joy of the Lord is my strength because, see, His joy doesn't wane. His joy doesn't weaken. Mine does. I can be absolutely depressed. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I can be hard pressed in the world. Still, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me quickly read this to you. Paul is writing, and he makes this comment. You've probably heard some of this before. Verse 5. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord. Why, Paul? Well, drawing back to Nehemiah, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not your joy. It's not what you've figured out. It's not your goodness. It's not what you have to offer. It's what He has offered us. Paul says, we preach Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying around in the body the dying of Christ, so the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. For we who, are, who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. How are you doing today? Have you had a joyful week or perhaps a hard week? Are you in a season where everything's going right and you're just cruising along? And, yeah, joy of the Lord! Woohoo! Or are you, like most people, most of the time, just going from one day to the next, struggling to get by, a little frustrated from time to time with life. You know, you can eat of the fat, you can drink of the sweet, and still have portions overflowing to share with those who have none, even if you're in a bad place. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's His joy. Something I I want you to understand is that as, as Christians, we are not called to be phony. And I've seen a lot of it. If you're having a hard day, you're not called to suddenly put on a happy face. 
my life's terrible, but praise God. You know? That's not it. You can say, my life's terrible. I'm having a really hard time. But I'm all right. How are you all right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. His joy permeates even my sorrow. His joy. It's not something that I dredge up. And even when it comes to welcoming people, when it comes to evangelism and outreach, my friends, we're not going to do it by generating some false energy in and of ourselves. It, it, it never works. People see right through it. That's part of the, hypocr- the, the hypocrisy people see in Christianity. No, they're just phony happy. And that's probably true. Too much phony happiness. Live your life understanding the joy of the Lord is our strength. Great. How do I get it? I would like the joy of the Lord to be my strength. The key is this, gang. The joy of the Lord is not about what you are doing or even what you can do. The people are mourning and weeping, and Nehemiah says, be joyful. Huh? They're weeping, Nehemiah. Be joyful. Well, Nehemiah, you can't just cut someone off in mid-cry. You can if the joy is not theirs to produce. If it's not their job to suddenly dredge something up that they're having trouble getting. If the joy is from another source, if the joy is the Lord's, then suddenly there's a whole new world of celebration. Because it's not about how I'm feeling that particular moment. It's about how he is always feeling. There's a name for phony, pretentious joy generated by those who think being Christian means putting on a happy face, and it is false religion. It's not true. It's not legitimate. If you want to avoid false religion, if you want to get out of a season of mourning and enter truly into the joy of the Lord, well, Rick, I'd like to do that. What is the joy of the Lord? Hold that thought. Read on, verse 11. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still. For the day is holy. Do not be grieved. So all the people went away to drink, to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. Which words? The joy of the Lord is your strength. Okay. Okay. Well, then on the second day, again of the seventh month, the heads of the father's households, of all the people, the priests, the Levites, were gathered to Ezra the scribe that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They're all back. Tell us more, Ezra. Well, they found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So they proclaimed, that's the Feast of Tabernacles. They find out, here it is, and we're supposed to be doing this. They proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hills and bring olive branches and wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof, and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim, the entire assembly of those who had returned from the Captivity made booths, tents, big, massive Israeli camp out. And they lived in them. And the sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day. And there was great rejoicing. That's a thousand years, roughly, that it had been since the people had come into the land in the first place. They hadn't celebrated, not like this. Now they had celebrated the Feast of Booths. Because we see it happening back in Ezra's day, about 15, 20 years earlier. They, they did it, but not like this. Not like this. There was not a celebration in Israel for a thousand years like this one. They were celebrating. And the Feast of Booths went on for an entire week. It tells us, verse 18, he read from the book of the law of God daily, from the first day to the last day. And they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to their ordinance. This is just great. It's wonderful. And here's where we truly see the joy of the Lord. I want you to get something here. It's wonderful, but even when they are trying to do it right, they get it wrong. Huh? They're so wrapped up in the celebration. So excited about the joy of the Lord that they start the Feast of Tabernacles on the wrong day. It's the second day. Supposed to be on the 15th. Leviticus 23:33. the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the 15th of the seventh month is the Feast of Booths for seven days to the Lord. And they're having this wonderful time in the Lord. Joy and enthusiasm greater than it had been. 
And they're so excited, they jump the gun and they start the festival, they start the celebration 13 days early. They can't wait for it. What happens? Well, if you read on, a great bolt of lightning comes down from heaven and destroys the people. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not in there. Does the Lord shout from the heavens, What's the matter with you people? Can't you even get one thing right? I gave you the date and you're messing it up. Back to the question. What is the joy of the Lord? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was the joy set before him? It's you. It's you. You are the joy of the Lord. Do you understand how, even when we're sorrowful, even when life is hard, the joy of the Lord is your strength? Even when we don't feel like we can get to the end of that day, The joy of the Lord is our strength, recognizing that Father looks at you and says, I just love to watch you. I get this this sense of God watching the children of Israel as they go about the Feast of Tabernacles, looking down and saying, they're just getting it wrong, but look at the celebration. Look at my kids. Last night, David was up from 3 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the morning. Just happy as a lark, wide awake. You know, walking around, fuzzy little head. <laughs> and I, you know, at one point Cheryl brought him into our bed, and then she took him out because she knew, you know, well, Rick's got to preach; he's got to get some sleep. And but I can hear him out in the living room with her. I can hear, oh, what are you doing? You know, doing what his little baby talk and. So around 4.30, I go out there just to check, make sure everything's okay. And, and he's just rolling around. <laughs> just having a marvelous time, middle of the night. And he just brings me such joy. You are the joy of the Lord. I mean, it's just, how astounding is that? Jesus, for the joy set before him, the joy is every single person who would be saved by the blood that he was about to pour out on the cross. That even the horror of the cross, physically and spiritually, how it would tear him apart from the Father. How the sin would be weighted down, all the sin of the world on his shoulders. How he would be burdened and punished for what he didn't even do. And he looked right through it. And he saw your face. And he saw mine. He said, man, that's worth it. Because they are my joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Isaiah 53.11 tells us as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. You realize there's only one thing that Jesus did not have that he gained by going through the crucifixion. And that's you. It's the only thing he didn't have. When God created and gave us free will... He gave us opportunity to sin and rebel against Him. The only thing that He created that He gave up was you. And so as Jesus stared down the cross, it wasn't about getting more glory. He already had it, waiting for Him in heaven. It wasn't about reestablishing His authority. He had it. The Father had given it to Him. It was you. It was me. The joy of the Lord. And i got to tell you, it is the single greatest thing that encourages me in hard weeks of life or ministry. It is the one thing that no matter what else is going on, I can look back to and say, yeah, but my Father still loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know. Why, Rick? Well, for the Bible told me so. Rick, you don't always get it right, but you are my joy. By the way, I just share this with you, a moment of joy for Cheryl and I on Friday was Adoption Day. Uh, we went up to Whatcom County, and yes, we had already adopted our, our three children, our three new kids. Um, but as of Friday, they became Crawfords. And it didn't mean a lot to them. They're just like, you know, what are we doing? You know, David doing his thing. But, but for us, 
for Cheryl and I, it's done. I mean, it is done, done, done. They have U.S. birth certificates. They are U.S. citizens. They are members of the Crawford household by law and everything else. And I, I just, I was thinking, these kids are our joy. They are just our joy. How much more so with Jesus that you are the joy set before him, the joy of the Lord. No wonder Nehemiah said what he said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Zephaniah 3.17. I realize this verse is is a proclamation over Israel, but it, I think, applies to us having been grafted in. Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. And the Bible tells us in Jude 24, He's able to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless, with great joy. Let's pray together. Father, it is truly astounding to me that the Lord God, Creator of all things, would draw joy out of looking at me for all my faults, my failures, my sins, for all the times I get it wrong. And yet, Lord, to know that my Father is pleased, that my Father loves me, that I was the joy set before you, Jesus, it fills my heart with a joy that is inexpressible. Lord, we thank You for telling us. And I pray this morning, Lord, over this fellowship, Your fellowship, over Your children, I pray, Father, fill us with Your joy. May we look at each other the way You look at us. For if I am Your joy, then, Father, every person I meet who walks in Jesus should be a joy to me as well. And everyone I meet, Father, who is lost outside of Jesus should bring a great sorrow to me and a desire for them to be blameless with great joy. Lord, I just pray Your Spirit would would really infuse this into our hearts and our minds, this, this understanding. And Lord, if anyone is sorrowful this morning, may they find that great peace in the joy that is Yours. May they find strength in You. And may we be lifted up, Lord, to look to You and and to realize if nobody else sees us where we are, You do. Nobody else seems happy that we're here. You are. Lord Jesus, we need the joy of Your Spirit truly to accomplish the task before us. Because we, like Israel, we're going to get it wrong every time. I I don't even know of all the evangelistic campaigns out there that have just gone wrong. (laughs) People trying to do their best. But Lord, we need your Spirit to guide us. And we as a fellowship, we want to be open and accepting and loving and reaching out and sending the portion of joy that you've given us to those who are lost, who don't have it. Father, I know of no other way for our hearts to be motivated than to ask Your Spirit to do it and to be in Your Word. And so we will continue to do so. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen.